Okay, so we're looking at angels and demons. As I said last week, Dwayne Garrett, he's an Old Testament scholar, he said in his book, Angels and the New Spirituality, the Bible will not tell you everything you ever wanted to know about angels. On many questions, we can only infer the answers, and on others, we're in the dark altogether. And that's true. So don't bum out if I leave you, on, you know, unsatisfied. Uh, the Lord will make it all clear to you at some point. But I'm going to do, I'll, I'll do, you know, try to do... Peace work and put things together, at least the way I understand things. And then we, uh, you know, I'll offer that to you. And if you think that hits or resonates, then take it. Okay, two weeks ago, we were looking at a, a study of angels. I, I, we looked at the existence of angels, the origin of angels, the nature of angels, and the names and classifications of angels. And when we ended, we were looking at the activities of angels and I noted in, in under that subheading, I noted that angels in Scripture frequently, they manifest themselves to deliver some message, particularly regarding a significant event. And you see that happening in Scripture. I pointed out that angels in Scripture, they often protect God's people, and they help them and deliver them from trouble. And I gave you my opinion that I don't think there's sufficient evidence for thinking that each Christian has an individual guardian angel, a one-on-one -on -one kind of correspondence. I think angels, obviously, they're ministering spirits, uh, you know, who serve. But the notion of a one-on-one -on -one thing, I just don't think there's sufficient evidence for that. Some people would disagree with that, but I, I explain to you why I see it the way I do. Angels in Scripture, they serve as agents of, of judgment, God's agents of judgment. You see that in a number of places. You see it in Revelation, for example. And the last thing I mentioned before I was so rudely interrupted by the bell is that uh, angels in Scripture, they're observers of human affairs. And one aspect of that's the implication in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 10, that angels observe Christian assemblies. And I just, uh, I like that. I think that's important. I think it would help us in our sense of what's going on, in adding a, a different dimension, an appreciation of a different dimension to what goes on when the body of redeemed people come together as a community and praise God. You see, I think there's something there, but we talked about that. Now, I want to say just a couple other things about the activities of angels. Angels in Scripture, they're involved in, in visions and in explaining and interpreting visions. So you see that in a number of places. You see it in Zechariah. You see it in Daniel, Ezekiel, Revelation. And angels in Scripture are sometimes described as being in the courts of the Lord where they spend much time praising God. And you can see that in Psalm 103, 20, Revelation 4 and 5, and I'm sure many other places. Now, before we leave talking about angels and go into uh, talking about demons... I wanted to mention something about New Age beliefs, because New Agers have latched on to angels in a big way. Uh, there were, at least five or ten years ago, tons of books. I doubt that it has slowed down, but I just quit caring about it. So, uh, you know, there were all kinds of books with a New Age spin and take on angels. Some of them, you, you had uh, Ask Your Angels by Alma Daniel, uh, Timothy Wiley and Andrew Raymer, A Book of Angels, Guardians of Hope. Angels of Mercy, The Angels Within Us. There are all kinds of books about this, and, and they all wind up taking some strange things. What they do, they draw on sources from all over the place. You know, the Pseudepigrapha, the Kabbalah, the Book of Mormon, uh, Gnostic writings, some from the Bible, and they just pick and choose whatever they want to create some kind of, uh, you know, story they want to tell. And the picture they want to paint without regard for, you know, how uh, treat all the sources the same and just pick and choose whatever I want, forgetting how things contradict and all that. Instead of actually trying to synthesize something, they wind up doing that. And a big thread that runs through these writings is that, look, angels are everywhere talking to everybody, talking to all kinds of people. And it, they, they do that regardless of their religious background, regardless of whether they're, um, you know, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, Mormon. It doesn't matter. You know, that they're, they're just, uh, they're above all that. They're talking to everybody, and that's one of the threads that you see. And they promote a number of false ideas, and, and from those books that I just mentioned to you, you can see all of these things, like angels are channeling messages through certain people. So essentially you have them see as means of revelation. They claim that angels can choose to be born as humans. You see, so they are all of these ideas. Some of them are actually comical, but uh, 
The discovering, the discovering angel names is a key to spiritual experience. You see that if you can discover their names, well, then that's a key and you really can unlock things for you. The human body contains eight chakras defined as centers of, of in the energy body. And that these chakras, you see, these are, are fundamental in meditation and thus they're fundamental in connecting with angels. So you may have seen that. I remember years ago on uh, uh, Johnny Carson, tell you how long ago that was. Uh, I can't think of that. McLean, Shirley McLean was on there and she's sticking these stickers on on uh, Carson about these are chakras. You know, she's a, a big new ager. Uh, one of the things they say is we can re- we can rediscover joy by reconnecting with our inner angel child. You see, and this is our inner angel child. And we can do that by letting go of the rid- ridiculous notion of being an adult. Well, you can see how that would have great play in our culture, wouldn't it? You know, that'd be great. Hey, I can be an irresponsible guy. Who cares? Well, what about being an adult? I don't like being an adult. I want to be a four-year-old. Okay, well, you know, this, this, they're pitching that kind of stuff. Uh, the growing awareness of and contact with angels is leading us into a utopic new age of harmony, love, and fulfillment. That's kind of a, a thread that you see here. Humans can progress through a series of incarnations to angelhood, a crowning spiritual achievement. So basically a kind of reincarnation thing, but you can go ahead and and progress and you can become an angel. That angels work with civilizations in other galaxies and with animals on earth. And you can see how that would tie in with radical environmentalism. You know, you see that, okay, we got the angels on our side and we're doing these kinds of things. All of these things run through. Angels will invigorate you when you're down with a, quote, heart to heart transfusion of golden liquid light. You see, if I read something like that, I'd just have to throw the book. <laughs> but that, you, this is the kind of, kind of thing that said. And that angels are indifferent to, to morality. I think this is a key here. See, they're indifferent to morality and teach that categories of right and wrong are illusory. And they only trap us in feelings of guilt, low self-esteem, and a judgmental spirit. Now, you tell me that wouldn't play in there. You see, so, oh, I, I, oh, oh, what's that? Well, no, the, see, the angels are coming in and they're saying this. The fact they contradict the Bible, who cares? We've constructed some kind of angel thing. So I just tell you that they've gotten into this in a, in a big way, and it's really nothing short of an alternative religion that's based on some kind of uh, alleged new revelation. And it's, uh, so I think, in fact, that what has happened is is that their openness to spiritual powers, these powers that they advocate, cause them to embrace demons in the guise of angels of light, because what they're promoting clearly is is anti-biblical. And so that's a, I just alert you to that. Now I wanted to spend some time, I was going to certainly this class, I think part of the next class, we'll see how much of the next class. But I wanted to talk a bit about, about the demons, New Age beliefs, there you go, and say a little bit about demons. Now, New Testament theologian, a man named Millard Erickson, he, he, he says uh, about studying Studying Satan and demons, he says, we need to be on our guard against two extremes. We should not take him too lightly, lest we disregard the dangers, nor, on the other hand, should we have too strong an interest in him. And I think that's right. You see, you don't want to be ignorant. You don't want to be, you know, you know unaware. But you don't want to be obsessed and focused on this because that's not the right balance. And you don't see that in Scripture. Now, many people today, they've gone to both extremes. Some deny the reality of Satan and demons. It's not, you know, that, that's just crazy talk. You know, that's just crazy. The idea that, come on, you know, we live in a, we live in a science. And this isn't surprising given the triumph of naturalism in our society. You see the idea that there is no reality beyond matter, energy, and this kind of thing. And so it's not surprising that you would then have people say, you know, the idea of spirit beings? Come on, man, that's like so, you know, ancient and ignorant. You see, so we have a number of number of people do that, where, where you have that, and, you know, it's not surprising from people who don't identify with Christ, but we also see people who identify with Christ, and they follow some prominent theologians in the middle of the 20th century. Some say, well, look, demons are merely mythological misconceptions or conceptions that are drawn from a, a superstitious biblical world. You see, yes, yes, they thought about that, but they're simply mythological concepts 
They're not true. They're not real. They're just an artifact of that of that ignorant culture or some character characterized characterize angels as just look. They're a personification of evil social forces and structures. They're not real beings. They're just a way of speaking about social structures, social forces and evil things and putting a personal face on them. OK, so you, you, you have people who when I say, look, there are two extremes to avoid. One is ignoring them. Well, I'm talking about that extreme right now. And, and one of the ways we do that is to say, look, you know, these things, they're just myths of an ancient Bible culture or they're just personifications of evil social structures. They're not real beings. OK, well, you basically you've dismissed them, you see. And I think that's a mistake. On the other hand, some people who identify with Christ, they become fixated on. Them. You see, and make this, you know, such a such a big, prominent part of of studying this kind of thing. They give them a prominence and a level of attention that's out of balance and in many cases actually unscriptural. So I just alert you and warn you about that, that these are two things, that two extremes that are to be avoided. Well, let's talk a little bit about the existence and nature of demons. The reality of demons, uh, it's clear from Scripture. Okay, that demons are real is obvious from Scripture. They're more prominent in the New Testament. There being scores of references to them. But they're also present in the Old Testament. For example, in Deuteronomy 32, 17, Psalm 106, 37, demons are present. And so they're all over the Bible. In the New Testament, demon possession and exorcisms, they're frequently mentioned. And Jesus cites his power over demons as a sign that in him the kingdom of God is being ushered in. See, that was one of the things that, you know, the, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In his person and being, in his ministry, here is the coming, the, the ushering in of the long-awaited kingdom of God. And one of the proofs of that is his power over demons. And so you see that being exhibited in many places in the New Testament. Even his opponents, they acknowledged his exorcisms. Even those who hated him and opposed him, they acknowledged his exorcism. They just said, well, he does it by the power of demons. That's how he's doing it. They didn't say he's not doing it. They said he does it by the power of demons. So there's an example where you see them uh, in the New Testament. Now, to say that demons, if you take these these uh, the approach that I first mentioned, if you say that demons are simply mythological conceptions from a superstitious culture, or if you say that they're just personal depictions of impersonal forces, well, then you're simply saying the Bible is false. You see that? I mean, just call it like it is if you say that. You're saying the Bible is false. Scripture clearly indicates that demons are real, personal beings. Now, however much you know that, that you don't like that, the Bible makes it clear that they are real, personal beings. They speak and they are spoken to. And there are a number of passages I have written down here I could cite to you, but you know them. They speak and they're spoken to. They possess intellect as they know Jesus to be the Son of God. Okay, I mean, they, they, that's something, you know, they, they possess this intellect, they know that, they recognize Paul and his companions as servants of God, or possibly portrayed them as servants of, servants of an ambiguous deity. There's a question there of exactly what they're saying in Acts chapter 16, 16 to 18. They believe there's one God, James chapter 2, verse 19, and they teach false doctrine. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Now, it's always an interesting uh, thought idea, well, how do they do that? You see, and that's one of the things about what is the physics of this, if I can say that. How do these spirit beings bring their ideas and influence people so that false doctrines are taught? And it's just not spelled out. You see, you don't get somewhere that it says, okay, here's how it works. But clearly there is a mechanism by which they are able to influence this world. And so you can see that in, in the teaching of false doctrine. They have emotion as they fear judgment. In James chapter 2, verse 9, they shudder okay, over their coming condemnation. And they have will. They didn't want to go into the abyss, you remember. You know, you know, we don't want to do that. We don't want to go there. Let us go into the pigs. And like angels, demons are spiritual beings, meaning they're invisible and immaterial, non-material beings. OK, just like like angels, they're called spirits in a number of passages, specifically called spirits. And in Ephesians 6, 12, the spiritual forces of evil are contrasted to flesh and blood. 
So you see, they're spirit beings. Unlike angels, however, demons in Scripture never become or appear to become physical so as to be visible to all. I don't know if you remember two weeks ago. Of course, you don't don't remember. Two weeks ago, we were talking about how angels, they're invisible spirit beings, but sometimes God gives someone the ability to see them. And then there are other times when angels apparently become physical or appear to become physical where they are objectively evident where other people can see them. Well, that doesn't seem to be the case in Scripture with regard to demons. We don't have any instances or situations. The serpent in the garden was clearly animated by Satan, the prince of demons, but the serpent is said to be one of the wild animals that God had made in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. So here he's one of those creatures who's animated by Satan, but it's not a, you know, it's not the demon himself appearing there. The only other time Satan or demons are seen as in visions. You can see them in Zechariah and Revelation. And the only time we're told anything about their appearance, of course, these are just, uh, you know, how they are portrayed. The only time we're told anything about their appearance, Revelation chapter 9, nightmarish locusts and fiendish cavalry. You see, in Revelation chapter 12, Satan is portrayed as a great red dragon. Revelation 16, verses 12 to 16, you see them as frogs. Now, that's the only time I know of any, any instance where they're, uh, they're described. Now, there's a possible exception to that in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 to 4, and we talked about that last week, where some understand, and I think that's how Peter understood the text, that sons of God there, that the sons of God there refer to demons, to fallen angels who married human women and conceived children by them, as wild as that sounds. But even if that's the right take on that, if that's the right reading, it could be that the way they did that was by possessing human males. You see, so that that really wouldn't uh, you couldn't tell from that whether that's an exception to this notion that unlike angels, we have no biblical instance of them becoming physical or appearing to be physical so as to be uh, evident to all. So you have that. Now, I know there's there's an idea about, well, maybe they're behind UFO sightings. And I know that. Well, you know, it's a, uh, uh, in fact, I think Creation Ministries International, Gary Bates and some other guys, I don't remember, Bates is the guy who's written on this. But, uh, you know, I don't know. You say, well, okay, it's not recorded in Scripture that they do that. Does that mean they can't? I don't know. You see? But there's something about it. And as, you know, people have pointed out that you, the UFO things usually are proclaiming some kind of false religion and this kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I know these guys are opponents, and they're evil and sneaky. And so, I don't know, I'm open to that. But I just say here, I know of no case in Scripture where you have an instance of them uh, manifesting like that. Now, also, unlike angels, demons are called, they're evil. Okay, angels aren't angels, are holy, righteous servants of God, but demons are evil. They're called evil spirits in a number of places, and they're unclean, meaning they are incompatible with God. So unlike, unlike, so when I speak of angels and fallen angels, it's angels and, and fallen angels are demons. So you see, they're evil, they're unclean. Paul speaks of them collectively as what? The spiritual forces of evil. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. John says the devil's been sinning from the beginning. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. Revelation 12, 7 and 9, we see that they're united with Satan in opposition to God. Okay, so unlike angels, these guys are bad. They're evil, they're unclean, the spiritual forces of evil, and as spiritual beings and as creatures who've lived thousands of years. Okay, I'm a young earth person, is what it's called. I believe that all of creation came into being thousands of years ago, not billions. And yes, I know how that makes me sound in our world, but I believe that's what the Bible teaches, and so I say thousands. Okay, so they're created and they wind up with, you know, so, but they've been around for a long, long time. They've lived thousands of years and they know things we do not know and they're quite skilled at reading humans. Now you can imagine, right? You have a spirit being. I don't know what innate knowledge they're created with. I assume it's tremendous innate knowledge. And then here they are, have lived for thousands, thousands of years and they are very, you know, they know a lot of stuff. They know an awful lot of stuff, and they're very skilled at reading us. And as invisible and highly mobile entities, they can gather much information without our knowing they gathered it. 
Right? I mean, if you're in a war with somebody, it would be something that people can come and you don't know they're there. And they can. So you see this. Now, this is an important thing. The good news is, at least one of the things I think is good, is that they do not know our thoughts. Okay, they've been around a long time. They know how to read people. They have a great deal of knowledge and information. Uh, they're, you know, have background where they, they're very skilled at reading people. They can gather information quickly. They're highly mobile. They're invisible. You don't know that. So they have an awful lot of info, but they cannot read our thoughts. Okay, that is something that only God knows people's thoughts. And you can see that in a number of places. Second Chronicles 6.30. 1 Kings 8, 39, Psalm 7, 9, 44, 20 to 21, Proverbs 15, 11, 16, 2, and probably other places. That is something that only God knows, and that's why Daniel told King Nebuchadnezzar that no one speaking by any power other than God could tell the king what he had dreamed. You see, that's something that's reserved for God, actually knowing people's thoughts. Now, it may look like that. Because they may be privy to things that you wouldn't, you know, you don't know. Well, how did they know that? Well, They were there. You just didn't know they were there. But in terms of reading people's thoughts and knowing people's thoughts, it's only God. And in that light, it's very significant that the New Testament reports that what Jesus knew the thoughts of people. I think, you know, that's pretty powerful. Only God knows the thoughts of people. And here's Jesus. He knows the thoughts of people. Okay, well, that's a clue. You see, that's what we call a clue. That uh, Jesus is something. he, He is divine. Very, very uh, special. Okay, so so they don't actually know people's thoughts, nor do they have innate knowledge of the future. You see, that that too belongs only to God. That is implied. If you read Isaiah 42, verses 8 and 9, and 46, 9 and 10, you can see that it seems clearly implied there that God is saying that he's distinguishing himself by his ability to know the future like that. And I also believe it's evident in Satan's participation in the crucifixion of Christ. I'll talk about that more a little bit later. But I think Satan was duped, essentially. He was the force behind the crucifixion of Christ. And if he had known what all was going to go on, I don't think that would have happened. Okay, so I think, I think you see it there. But their superhuman knowledge of the present and past... Right? They have superhuman knowledge of what's going on now because they're invisible, highly mobile, live for thousands of years, very uh, skilled at reading people. They have superhuman knowledge of the present and the past. That can give them extreme insight into the future. And I think that's what's behind the so-called fortune-telling slave girl in Acts chapter 16. You know, it can certainly look that way, right? I mean, if I know all these things, I know what's happening over here and here and all this. So, oh, this, that. Okay, so you can see how that, but I don't think they have an innate ability to actually know the future. Now, demons also manifest superhuman strength when they possess someone. Okay, you can see that in the the Gerasene demoniac. He's able to break apart chains. Nobody from that region could subdue him. Okay, I mean, maybe he was a big muscular dude, but I mean, he's obviously, uh, you know, when he's possessed, he's out there. And you, you see that, and then you also see the uh, the demon possessed man in Acts nineteen thirteen to sixteen. He overpowered seven brothers, causing them to flee naked and bleeding. So there's something about when the, when the demons possessed people that they had this supernatural or superhuman strength. Well, what about the origin of demons? Now it's clear that they were created by God through Christ. Okay, you can see that clearly in Colossians chapter one verse sixteen. It stresses that all things including spiritual beings, were created by God through Christ. Paul says there, he says, For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. Okay, so nothing's being left out. Everything other than God that exists was created by God. Okay, so that's that's an important uh, thing for us to note here. Now, we know from Genesis chapter one, verse thirty one, that all of creation was originally not only good, but very good. Okay, so we have in Genesis one thirty one, we have the creation account and then we have God's pronouncement that it is all very good. Okay, Genesis chapter one, verse thirty one. And we also know from many passages in Scripture, what, that the evils are, that that the demons are evil and unclean, as I just mentioned. 
uh, incompatible with God. So here in Genesis 131, creation is very good. We see demons are evil. They're incompatible with God. So from that, we deduce. You see, it's not spelled out, but from that we deduce that demons were originally created good and then turned against God. You see, that's where, that's where that comes from. That's standard theology is that, you know, that, that we had some kind of rebellion, some kind of rejection of God, but originally created good and then turned against God. Now, some people think that Second Peter 2, 4 and Jude 6 are direct references to this original angel rebellion. That that's what they're talking about, that those texts mean, no, it's referring to when the angels first fell. Second Peter 2, 4 refers to angels who sinned. Jude, verse 6, speaks of angels who did not keep their own dominion, but deserted their proper dwelling. So you definitely see the idea of something happening with angels. But depending on how a person understands sons of God, in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 to 4, That factors into the thing. These verses may refer to a later particularly outrageous sin of some fallen angels. You sit there and say, this is, this is wild. Well, this is, I'm just telling you what it looks like. You see, is that it it could be, and I think my judgment is, probably is, a reference to that we had of the set of fallen angels that you had a subset of those fallen angels who engaged in a particularly outrageous sin of marrying human women and having children by them. And you say, well, that just sounds mythological because the idea... But they don't have to, you see. Some people think they did manifest physically and married them. But that wouldn't have to be the case. It could be that they possessed human males, married them that way, and then had children. And I say the the offspring are called men. Uh, which I tend to favor that, that understanding. But you have two different ways of going on that. As you see, okay, if Second Peter 2, 4 and Jude 6, if these, are, if these are direct references to the initial angel rebellion, well, then you have all this talk about chaining and everything. That's some kind of figurative language to show graphically that the fallen angels, the demons, are under divine condemnation and that their final doom is assured. In other words, it takes on that symbolic sense of that's what's meant by it when, when those texts speak of their being chained. Now, if, they're, if those verses are referring to this, this subset of angels, of demons that, that engaged in a particularly outrageous sin, well, then what, you, then what you have is you have two groups or two classes of demons, fallen angels. You have those that are relatively free, I presume in, their, in terms of their ability to exert influence on earth. And you have those that are chained, I presume, relatively less free in their ability to exert influence on earth. So that's how, you know, in, in looking at those things, it seems clear to me that you had an angel rebellion of some kind. They're created good. God pronounces that everything is very good. We know they're evil. So something happened. And I'm just trying to say what scriptures say about it. And I give you those texts where some people say, well, that refers directly to it. Uh, it may not refer directly to it, to the fall. It may be later than that in this particularly outrageous sin of some demon. Now, four texts are cited as direct references to the original fall of Satan. You see this a number of times. Uh, those texts, Isaiah 14, 12 to 15, Ezekiel 28, 11 to 19, Luke 10, 18, and Revelation 12. But it seems doubtful that those texts refer to the uh, fall of Satan. Now, it it may be in a secondary sense, and you see people do that sometimes. It's pretty clear that, at least in the first instance, it's not referring, you know, the Isaiah and Ezekiel texts are not referring to Satan. But it uses some grandiose language, so people say, well, it must be uh, somehow referring to it in some way. Okay, I'm not sold on that, Uh, So if that's not right, if those texts aren't referring to the fall, then we really have nothing to guide us about what is behind the fall. What's the truth of the fall? We're not told when this occurred. Uh, That's another question. When did this fall occur then? See, you know, we want to, we say, I want to know this. Okay, so I say, well, you know, ask the Lord when you see him. (laughs) You see, we're not, you know, it's just not spelled out for us. But some of the pieces you can look at, you see, it, it, it apparently happened between Genesis 1.31, when there was the pronouncement that, that creation is very good, 
where God says that in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, where Satan, through a serpent, tempts Eve to sin. So it looks like to me, now you could, I guess somebody could say, well, no, when he says creation is very good, that's not inconsistent with the presence of evil angels, and that just doesn't strike me as right. Okay, so that would be, you know, that's the assumption that I'm making, that is that the pronouncement very good implicitly eliminates the existence of demons. So when he says that, they don't exist yet. So that then at 131, they have to, that rebellion has to occur after that point, And it has to have occurred by Genesis chapter 3 when the serpent is tempting, Satan is tempting her through the, through the uh, uh, serpent. Okay, so that's, that's what I think. But, you know, where and, and what? You just aren't told about that. Now, many people are often guided by what I, in my opinion, are misinterpretations of that Isaiah and Ezekiel text. They claim that angels, or Satan in particular, fell because of pride, greed, lust, ambition, that kind of thing. And that may be right, but I just don't think we're specifically told that. You see, I don't think it's, it's right to, to go to those texts and say, here in Scripture is revelation of the motive behind Satan's fall. I mean, it makes perfect sense to me. But I just don't know that you can look there and you can say that with that kind of confidence that Scripture is behind it. I think the most that can be said is that God granted angels free will to determine whether to seek their fulfillment in him or in themselves. That they had, a, they had free will whether to seek fulfillment in him or in themselves, and some chose the latter. Some chose to seek fulfillment in themselves rather than in God. And the result of that turning, the result of that choice, was the solidification and intensification of the perversity, the viciousness, and the wickedness that has since characterized demons. In other words, it was a, when they chose that way, they hardened and intensified, and they became the forces that we know them to be. Evil, vicious, opposed to everything that is good. And I think that's, that's what, uh, you know, the most that can be said. Now, the rebellion of angels, it raises a question of whether we will be in danger of rebelling after we die. You say, look, if that's right, we have these angels who are created, uh, they're created, they're spirit beings, and then they rebel at some point. Well, are we going to do that? And the answer is no, we're not going to do that. And let me tell you just a, just a couple of things that lead me to that. See, we, we, will not, we will no longer yield to sin as Christ does not sin. You see, we're going to be like that. You see, we will no longer choose to sin. Now, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16, 19 to 31. Okay, that makes clear that, that one's location in the intermediate state. Okay, this is, deals with the intermediate state of the dead. And you have that picture there, that parable of, of Lazarus and the rich man. And Abraham says in verse 26 that what? A great chasm has been fixed so that there can be no passage between the locations in the intermediate state of blessing and torment. Nobody's going from here to there. Nobody's going from there to here. They are fixed. There is a great chasm. Well, that can only mean that those in the blessed intermediate state will not sin. You see, because otherwise you would have that blessed state tainted that close relationship with God and that blessed state filled with sin, and that can't be. So I, I, I draw from that. I say, okay, well, then that means that in the intermediate state, it's clear that that's not going to take place. And then as John says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, Christians who are alive at Christ's return will at that time be like him. You see? Meaning that there's a transformation. We are in root to Christ's likeness now. We are Christians who... God's Spirit is within us, and He is transforming us into His image. Now, that's a rocky road in this fallen world, this overlap of ages, but the graph is going up. You see? So we are being transformed, but on that day, those here, there's going to be a finalization of that transformation. So that He says in 1 John 3, 2, we will be like Him. And in the words of Thomas Johnson in his commentary, he says, there will be a transforming vision at the return of Jesus, in which believers will be purified of all that still separates them from complete likeness to Christ. See 2 Corinthians 3.18. So I, I don't have any fears of that. I don't have any worry about that. But I do think the angels rebel. I don't think that will happen to us. 
Now, you say, well, what's behind that? Okay, if I could point to a text and tell you what was behind it, I would do it, but I can only speculate. And what I think is going on is that God apparently did not initially grant to angels the transforming vision of his glory. See, what has been called the beatific vision, where God has a, he, he grants by his grace, you know, they had, the, these angels had innate knowledge of God. They were created with tremendous powers and innate knowledge of God. But whatever perception they had of his glory, that knowledge and perception with which they were created, it didn't include the perception to transform, the perception that transforms such that one will never choose to sin again. You see, so there, there is, by God's grace, a perception of his being that he grants that has the effect on creatures of making it so they will never choose to sin. And that is what we will have. You see, that's what he means when he says, you know, when he returns, we will be like him. That is why in the intermediate state that there is, that the chasm is, is permanent. It is because God has granted that transforming perception of himself that when one is given that, then one will never choose to sin. Okay, so apparently God did not initially grant that to angels. You say, well, why not? Well, he, hasn't, he didn't grant it to people when he created them. Right? He, he didn't grant it to angels when he initially created them. There was a choice that had to be made before God would grant the eternally transforming perception of his glory. Some angels chose to seek fulfillment in themselves rather than God, and with that choice they were denied that transforming vision. Others chose to seek fulfillment in God rather than in themselves, and God gave them that transforming vision. So that there is no risk of them sinning. They have been completely turned in so that they have no desire and will not choose to sin. Okay, that's what I think is going on now. Now, the fall of Satan and angels, it raises the question, well, why did God give them freedom to choose? Okay, well, this is back, you know, these are basic questions that you say, well, why did God give them freedom to choose when he foreknew the evil and the suffering that would occur? And all I can say is that in, the, in their case, as in the case of, of uh, humans, you know, see, we, just as in the case of humans, is that God wanted them like us to choose him from within a certain environment, from within a certain environment or state that offered a certain perception and view and grasp and understanding of God. He wanted us to choose from within that epistemological environment. That's what he wanted. So he creates there, and there's a time, choose! And he wanted us to do that, and he wanted them to do that, And to provide that choice, it was necessary to provide what? The potential for rejection. You cannot logically create choice and no choice. You see, when people say, well, God can do anything. No, nobody means by that that God can do what is logically incoherent or logically impossible. He can't make a four-sided triangle or a rock too big he can't pick up. You've heard that those things are logical insanities. What it means to say God can do anything, he can do anything that is subject to power. Okay, that's what it means. And so he cannot create choice and not choice. So by creating choice, God wanted him, people and these spirit beings to choose him within a cert, from within a certain environment. And to do that, God risked some would reject him. And some did. And they became demons. And some didn't. And they became the angels that forever praise God and serve him. Now, demons, which include Satan, they are mere creatures. Okay? They are in no way equal to God. The Bible knows nothing of dualism. Okay? This idea that you have two equally powerful forces, one good and one evil, struggling for control of the world. Nonsense. Bible knows nothing of that, nothing of dualism. Demons are in rebellion, but God sets the limits of that rebellion, and I thank God for that. You see, He sets the limits of that rebellion. And you know that, Job chapters 1 and 2, you can see that there, right? They're, they're, they're not free to do whatever they choose. In Job 1 and 2, Satan couldn't harm Job or any of his possessions without God's permission to do it. 
You say, well, why would God do that? See, that's why you get into this whole idea of evil and suffering. What is going on in the mind of God that he allows the things to happen that he does? And you and I just aren't big enough to see it. That's the message of Job, at least as I read Job. Here is Job who doesn't understand. We, the reader, are told there's something going on in heaven to which Job is not privy. That God has a purpose and a reason for allowing Job to suffer because Job will vindicate God and glorify him in this world. Job's just living his life. And what happens? Suffering after suffering after suffering. And Job can't understand it. I think that's how it is. And the bottom line, when God appears in the whirlwind and he says, you know, hey, where were you when I'm out you know, throwing quasars out and doing this kind of stuff? Basically, the idea is you are not competent to judge me. You are not competent to judge me. You have to trust me. I am the one who created the world. And never forget, I am the one who watched his son suffer for you. So never think that I don't love you. Never think I'm not committed to you. Never think that however it looks in this world that I am not absolutely 100% for you because this reality will test you. It will make you think that he is estranged and away and doesn't care and doesn't love me. And God says, the cross says for eternity, I love you to death. You see, I love you to death. So you see that, and, we, and that's just, we have this idea. We, we see that demons are not, it's not set up that way. Demons are on God's leash. And there are other ramifications of that, that uh, for which I'm very thankful. But I did hear that bell. Thanks.